This week, Pope Benedict XVI becomes the first pope in 600 years to resign. We bring you reaction from cardinals who are on hand for the announcement. And we look at what happens next. Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections for the week of February 15th. And what a historic week it's been, with Pope Benedict XVI becoming the first pope in 600 years to resign. Now, the Code of Canon Law does allow for a pope to resign. The only requirements are that he does so freely and makes his decision known publicly. Pope Benedict made his announcement at the end of a consistory with a group of cardinals. Here's how that moment unfolded. Qua propter bene consus pontes huius actus plena libertate declaro, me ministerio episcopi Rome, successori sancti peti, vi permanus cardinalium, di undivicesimo aprilis bis millesimo quinto commissum, renunciare ita da die vicesimo octavo febbraio bis millesimo tredicesimo ora vicesima, Sedes Rome, sedes Sancti Petri vacet, et conclave ad elicendum novum sum pontificem, ab his quibus competit convocandum esse. The announcement touched off a frenzy of activity, both with journalists scrambling to get details and with the Vatican working to get answers to journalists' questions. One Italian journalist scooped everyone. A reporter with the Italian news agency ANSA understood the Pope's announcement in Latin and tweeted in Italian from the press hall, the Pope has announced his resignation. Within hours, the director of the Holy See press office held a briefing for journalists. Taking his place in the press hall, Father Federico Lombardi said, The Pope took us by surprise. He said this was not a decision the Pope made on the spur of the moment, but a carefully discerned and thought out move. Father Lombardi also read a passage from the book Light of the World, based on a series of interviews the Pope gave to the journalist Peter Sewald in 2010. In it, Sewald asks Pope Benedict if he thinks a Pope could or should resign, and Pope Benedict answers that he believes it is a Pope's duty to step down if he realizes that he can no longer has the physical, spiritual, or mental capacities to fulfill his ministry. In a second briefing on Tuesday, Father Lombardi said the Vatican's protocol office is working through the many questions this resignation brings, like what do you call a pope after he resigns? What we do know is after February 28th, Pope Benedict will leave the Vatican for Castel Gandolfo. He will stay there through the sede vacante period and the conclave, and sometime after a new pope is chosen, Benedict will move back to Vatican City and take up residence in the Mater Ecclesia convent located in the Vatican Gardens. The convent used to be home to an order of contemplative sisters, and there Pope Benedict will live out the rest of his days in prayer and contemplation. Now, Pope Benedict is continuing with the audiences and liturgies that were already scheduled for this week. On Wednesday, he held his weekly general audience as scheduled. Of course, there was a whole different feel to the event.
After an extended applause, Pope Benedict greeted the faithful gathered in the audience hall. He thanked them for their prayers and he said he has physically felt the power of their prayers. He also said he arrived at his decision to resign after examining his conscience before God and being aware that he can no longer fulfill his ministry with the strength it requires. The rest of the audience proceeded as usual with the Holy Father giving a catechesis. He focused, of course, on Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent. We begin our yearly Lenten journey of conversion in preparation for Easter. The 40 days of Lent recall Israel's sojourn in the desert and the temptations of Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry. The desert as a place of silent encounter with God and decision about the deepest meaning and direction of our lives is also a place of temptation. In his temptation in the desert, Jesus showed us that fidelity to God's will must guide our lives and thinking, especially amid today's secularized society. While the Lord continues to raise up examples of radical conversion, like Pavel Florensky, Etty Hillis, and Dorothy Day, he also constantly challenges those who have been raised in the face to deeper conversion. In this Lenten season, Christ once again knocks at our door and invites us to open our minds and hearts to his love and to his truth. May this example of overcoming temptation inspire us to embrace God's will and to see all things in the light of his saving truth. After the general audience, Pope Benedict celebrated Mass for Ash Wednesday. Now, traditionally, Ash Wednesday is celebrated at the Church of San Anselmo on the Aventine Hill. There's a Vesper service there, and Pope Benedict processes to the Basilica of Santa Sabina for the actual Mass and imposition of ashes. But this year, given the circumstances and the fact that so many people would want to participate in this Mass, it was moved to St. Peter's Basilica. In his homily, the Holy Father said, We are gathered here at the tomb of St. Peter to ask for his intercession, for the direction of the Church, and to renew our faith in the Supreme Pastor. Turning his attention to Lent, he said, Jesus denounces religious hypocrisy and attitudes that seek applause and approval. True disciples, he said, do not serve themselves or the public, but the Lord. At the end of the Mass, Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone said a few words to Pope Benedict. Cardinal Bertone said, Not just the Church, but the whole world has accepted Pope Benedict's decision with profound respect. The Cardinal added, We know it is your profound love for God and the Church that brought you to this act, which reveals the purity of your soul. He closed his remarks, saying the faithful give thanks for the guidance Pope Benedict has given the Church and have deep admiration for the example he has given of a simple laborer in the vineyard of the Lord.
Grazie, ritorniamo alla preghiera. Dominus Vobiscum. Another event that was on the schedule before the Pope's announcement was the Holy Father's meeting with the parish priests of Rome. Speaking without a prepared text, he said it was a gift to be able to meet with the clergy of Rome one last time before the end of his papacy. He said, though I am now retiring to a life of prayer, I will always be close to you and I am sure all of you will be close to me even though I remain hidden from the world. Then he said that given his age, he could not prepare a real speech, but he thought he'd chat with the priests about Vatican II. He shared an anecdote from his teaching days in Bonn about how he met Cardinal Siri, who shared Joseph Ratzinger's notes from a recent talk with the public in Genoa. Cardinal Siri was then called to Rome to meet Paul VI, who told the Cardinal, you said things I wanted to say but couldn't. And that is how Joseph Ratzinger ended up attending the Second Vatican Council as an expert advisor. Now, for a full text of Pope Benedict's talk with the priests of Rome, visit our website, saltandlighttv.org slash Vatican Connections. Reaction to the Pope's announcement has been pouring in since he made his announcement on Monday. Of course, the first cardinal to react was Angelo Sodano at the consistory. He was visibly moved when he told the Holy Father we love you and we are close to you now as we have been throughout your pontificate. Catholic News Service spoke to Cardinal Edwin O'Brien, Grand Master of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre, who was at the consistory. I was in the uh, aula when the Holy Father made his uh, surprising blockbuster announcement. And I think, uh, as you've heard and as many have said, there was just a stunned reaction on the part of everyone. Uh, my, my Latin is not that great, and I couldn't hear him that well, but I could tell from those who were close up that uh, something serious was being said, and I, I got the gist of it pretty quickly. Everyone said it's going to take a day or two at least to begin to come to grips with it, to let it sink in, and uh, to uh, try to anticipate what the, uh, what the future will bring, the near future, the next couple of weeks. And really, my thoughts have been mainly with the Holy Father these days, and I think that's going to be the case until, until this whole episode is, is, is well behind us. It had to be a, a wrenching decision for him to make. Uh, the fact that he is certain he made the right decision, I'm quite sure he is certain of that, still doesn't change the emotions. He's still, I'm sure, um, anticipating in the next two weeks, uh, which are going to be very difficult leading up to his actual resignation. And then the adjustment that will be made uh, to try to separate himself from these wonderful years that, uh, during which he's led us and to a whole new, um, uh, whole new surroundings and, and way of life. In one sense, it will be easier for him, but in another sense, it's going to be a, a, a very traumatic transition, I think. So I, I've been kind of um, praying and quite, quite taken by it, for his sake mainly, really. Another cardinal, Francis Arinze, the former head of the Pontifical Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of Sacraments, told CNS what he felt hearing the Holy Father's words. We were there for a normal consistory meeting where, before the Pope canonizes new saints, he calls all of us, cardinals, bishops around, and says, this is their life. Do you vote in favor of canonization or do you not? We got the papers long before. And when we concluded that, we were about to get the blessing. And he said, please sit down. I have something to say <laughs> important for the church. So it was for us a surprise, like thunder that gives no notice that it's coming. As he moved on from what he was saying as the, the introduction, I began to fear that that's what he would come to. The cardinals, each one looked at the other in silence, in surprise, but it was clear what he said. At the end, there was silence. Then the Cardinal Dean got up and spoke. 
obviously he was hinted before because he had written what he said, Cardinal Sodano, and he said our mind. We are surprised. We love you, Holy Father. We are near you. We know you have done this because of your love for the church. And we will stand near you and we will do our best for the church. I haven't any doubt about his wisdom. I have known him for more years to have any doubt at all. He doesn't rush. He is not rash. He is gentle. But he's also clear-headed and firm. So it could not have been an idea he got the day before. If anybody is confused, the problem is on the side of that person, not on the side of the Pope. Very clear on the side of Pope Benedict, he says, 28 February at 8 o'clock, I shall resign from Bishop of Rome and successor of St. Peter. The church will find another one. And God is always there. The Holy Spirit does not go on holidays. So, there will be another Pope. He will be elected in two weeks or so. There is no danger that Pope Benedict will become a problem for that Pope. Certainly not. Perhaps if he were a politician who was removed by maneuvers, <laughs> perhaps the, the successor would be afraid. In this case, not so. For some people may be so shaken that it may change their perception. But my hope and prayer is it will help many to get more mature in our faith. Our faith is not on the Pope, it is on Christ, who is the foundation of the church. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and the same forever. And of course, across Canada, bishops have been reacting, reflecting on what they think will be the legacy of Pope Benedict's papacy. Pope Benedict's legacy is manifold, it seems to me. Uh, from the beginning of his pontificate, he was recognized as a man, obviously, of great and, in fact, unparalleled intellect, who understood probably better than many uh, the full tradition of the, the church, its beauty, and was able to, 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 to teach it and pass it on with just great clarity. And everyone appreciated that much. I do think his legacy, though, is beyond that. For me, his legacy is his witness to joy. From the beginning of his pontificate, it was clear that he loved the Lord, and he loved being a Christian. And that infused all of his manners, his speaking, all that he said. Uh, as Pope, like any Pope, he had to confront some very difficult challenges, not just within the church, but also in the world. And he didn't shy from confronting those with his great commitment to the truth. And yet in spite of the manifold challenges that he faced, he was constantly a man of joy. His lasting legacy, I guess time, uh, time will tell, but his, uh, his gentleness, his humility, is, is the servant, and that's what he said at the beginning of his papacy, I'm, I'm a, an instrument, a servant. And it's important because it, it's really in the sense of successor of Peter. Peter is a servant. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, tells to Peter, when you were young, you did well, were doing what you wanted to do. Now that you're old, someone else will lead you. And as a simple man, as a gentleman, he let, uh, he let the Holy Spirit guide him and be a, a pastor for all of us. So his gentleness and humility, I think, uh, touched certainly my heart and will has, uh, have a resounding effect on the church. Pope Benedict will uh, remain a, one of the great popes uh, because of the particular contributions that he made. I think in, in the areas of interfaith relations, particularly with Islam, his famous speech at Regensburg, despite the immediate controversy around it, uh, I think did it spark uh, 
kind of a new springtime in serious relations, interfaith relations between the Catholic Church and Islam. In a similar vein, his particular outreach to the Orthodox. Uh, after many years of the Holy See working to establish relations with Russia, that that was finally achieved uh, during Benedict's uh, pontificate. Uh, the outreach and the constant good relations also with the ecumenical patriarch of uh, Constantinople, his visits to uh, Constantinople uh, uh, for the feast of St. Andrew, that um, Benedict looked uh, very much uh, to the east in his uh, efforts, and I think that was a, will remain a, a milestone of his papacy. Did you know the last pope to resign was Pope Gregory XII in 1415 to put an end to the Great Western Schism? There were three claimants to the papacy, and Gregory XII believed resigning would solve the problem. As you can imagine, the atmosphere in Rome is just incredible this week. It is, as we've mentioned, a historic moment. So we spoke to Frank Rocca, the Bureau Chief of Catholic News Service in Rome, and we asked him about the mood on the ground. Well, I think people are still absorbing uh, this. Uh, I, you know, I spoke to a couple cardinals today, and uh, one of whom was in the room when uh, Pope Benedict uh, made the announcement on Monday. He still doesn't have uh, the words uh, to explain exactly what's happened, and and and, and people don't know uh, what's going to happen. They did. There's so many unanswered questions because this is uh, practically unprecedented. And what's what's striking is that there doesn't exist the sort of usual language to talk about this. So it's a moment of kind of openness. It's a disturbed moment, but it's also a, a, a moment of great, a very interesting and, and, and fascinating and stimulating moment. With just a few weeks left in Pope Benedict's pontificate, there are questions about what happens now. The Holy See had confirmed that Pope Benedict will keep many of the appointments that are scheduled for him until February 28th, with a few modifications. On Saturday, the Holy Father would meet with the President of Italy and the Prime Minister, both of whom requested brief audiences to say their goodbyes. Then Sunday, Pope Benedict and the Curia begin their Lenten spiritual exercises. That means no general audience on Wednesday, February 20th. In fact, no public engagements again until February 24th, when the Holy Father leads the Angelus again. February 27th will be his final general audience and on the 28th, Pope Benedict will have one final meeting with the College of Cardinals, and then he will board a helicopter that will take him to Castel Gandolfo, and the interregnum will officially begin. Now, normally this is the segment where we answer your questions, but this week it seemed more fitting to use this segment to share your thoughts about Pope Benedict's resignation and his legacy as a Pope. On our Facebook page, many of you posted about what you will remember from Benedict's papacy. Veronica said she'll remember his smart, humble service to Christ. Attending one of his masses in Rome was also part of my journey home into the Catholic Church. Richard said he'll remember his book, Jesus of Nazareth, The Infancy Narratives. Meanwhile, Aaron said his writings although it took me a good number of times reading them to really be able to even start to understand the depth of what he was saying at times, and seeing the look of joy on his face at World Youth Day Madrid, I will never forget that look. Jay posted, I think this is truly an act of humility on the Pope's part to recognize he is unable to continue his duty to the full extent. May God bless him. Now keep your comments coming via our Facebook or Twitter pages and by email or post. And if you're going to Rome for the conclave, by all means, send us a postcard. Vatican Connections is interactive. Send us your questions or comments by Facebook, Twitter, email, or post. Via email, send comments to info at saltandlighttv.org and by post, Send letters to 114 Richmond Street East, Toronto, Ontario, M5C1P1, Canada. 
Now, in this week's Roman Profile, we bring you an exclusive look at the Vatican Gardens, which is also the location of the Mater Ecclesia convent where Pope Benedict will live after a new pope is elected. Our team was there during the Synod on the new evangelization, and they brought us this exclusive. The Vatican Gardens were built by Pope Nicholas III in 1279. The orchard, lawns, and gardens cover more than 50 acres. Atop Vatican Hill is a reconstruction of the Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes. Built by Pope Leo XIII in a time when popes didn't travel, the statue and altar are the originals which stood in the place where Mary appeared to Bernadette in Lourdes in southern France. The Pope's devotion to the Blessed Mother heavily influenced Mariology in the 20th century. In 1992, Pope John Paul II opened a cloistered convent for nuns inside the Vatican, called Mater Ecclesiae. The Pope invites a different contemplative community every five years to pray for the Pope and for the Church. The most recent addition to the Vatican Gardens is the fountain dedicated to St. Joseph, the patron of the Universal Church. It was built as a gift to the current Pope Benedict XVI in July of 2010 in honor of his baptismal name, Joseph. Six bronze reliefs line the wall of the fountain, depicting the scenes of Joseph in the New Testament. The marriage of Mary and Joseph. The Annunciation to Joseph in the Gospel of Matthew the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, the flight to Egypt, the finding of the child Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem, Joseph in the holy house teaching Jesus his trade. And that's it for this week's edition of Vatican Connections. Next week, the Holy Father will be taking part in Lenten spiritual exercises. But we'll bring you more details about what will happen to Pope Benedict after February 28th and how a conclave works. We'll also show you what Holy Week celebrations look like at the Vatican, no matter which Pope is leading the Church. From everyone here, thank you for watching. <laughs>